I just wanted to say I'm so proud to be part of a team that has become such an influential policy institute in the country. I wanted to thank Alan and Judy Broadbent for your support over the past two decades, and Colin Robertson and Tom Barber for your commitment to Caledon. Um, I'm also so honored to work with Ken Battle and with Michael Mendelssohn, two, two of the sharpest policy minds in the country. And honestly, coming to work every day is both exhilarating and humbling, I, I have to say. And I'm sure you all share my appreciation for the work of Andre Picard. Um, Andre gives us all, I think, uh, an eloquent and a public voice every day on issues related to health care, disability, and the aging society. So thank you so much for agreeing to join our panel today. It's really a great pleasure. This is a very big subject that we're going to be talking about today, and actually I should say subjects. We've put this uh, disability and the aging society together on the same panel, but I will be very clear, we don't consider these to be synonymous. These are two very separate issues that we'll be discussing separately. The disability community has always been very careful about confounding its issues with those of the aging society. And similarly, seniors don't see themselves as a total group of people with disabilities. But there are some important areas of overlap, especially when it comes to the financing of community supports and the availability of supports in communities to enable independent living. So we'll point out some of those areas. But first, with respect to disability, about 14 million Canadians, 14%, uh, I'm sorry, 4.4 4 million Canadians, or 14% of the population is considered to be disabled. And while we use the term persons with disabilities, this is actually a very broad umbrella concept, including many, many different kinds of people. So we have people, for example, who were born with a disabling condition, like developmental disability, for example, or cerebral palsy. We have people who may have acquired a disability throughout the course of their lifetime as a result of accident or injury or illness. And then we have people who experience functional limitations as a normal sort of part of the aging process. And there are some disabilities that are quite stable and predictable, and others that are considered degenerative conditions, where you're functioning is going to likely deteriorate over time. And then there are disabilities considered to be episodic conditions, and that means that you have symptoms that recur and remit. And when they remit, you can function fairly well. And when they recur, you may experience uh, serious limitations in your ability to function. And what that means is it presents complexities for the policy environment. It means that we have to think about a wide range of people and their varying needs when we're considering various policy proposals. But despite the variation, there are several needs in common. And I would say there are three major kinds of needs upon which we have focused our attention. First is the need for an adequate income in order to purchase essentials like food, clothing, shelter. Second, many people with disabilities incur additional costs related to their disability. And third, everybody has a need to participate. And at Caledon, we focused our work on those three common areas of need. But just by way of background, I wanted to share with you some history that you may find interesting. I first became involved in this area in 1981. It was the International Year of Disabled Persons. And our parliamentary, uh, the, the government, the federal government, had appointed an all-party parliamentary committee to look at the wide range of issues related to disability. One of my first tasks was to look at all our pieces of legislation to find out references to idiot, imbecile, feeble-minded, and moron. And unfortunately, those two terms were all too frequent in our legislation. The committee produced the obstacles report, which made 130 recommendations for change. And the most important was including physical and mental disability as proscribed grounds of discrimination in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms that was coming into effect the following year. Canada effectively became the first country in the world to include disability protection in our constitution. It was very important. And as a result of that report, there were many changes made in the country, and you can see them around us. For example, ramps on, on, uh, you know, to buildings to replace stairs, or curb cuts on the sidewalk, or closed captioning for the hearing impaired, or wider doorways. But we have not made sufficient progress in other areas. We really let those languish. 
people with mental illness to whom Francis Lincoln was referring. We have not done a good enough job in a policy, in a policy framework in terms of the needs of those individuals with developmental disability. We have not done sufficiently well from a policy perspective. And other areas like income security and disability supports that I will discuss have really not seen enough progress. And it's in those areas that at Caledon we focused our efforts. With respect to income security, one of the major problems is that people with disabilities experience disproportionately higher rates of poverty because of their lower rates of labor force participation. And as a result of that, we see many of them have to rely on the income security program in Canada, on the disability income system in Canada. Now calling that a system, the disability income system, is actually an undeserved compliment because we don't really have a system. What we have is a group of separate programs with very little interaction. There's a cluster of programs that compensate for loss of function, like workers' compensation. There's a group of programs that replace lost earnings, like Canada Pension Plan Disability Benefit. And then there's a group of programs that provide income support, primarily welfare, provincial territorial social assistance. There are about 550,000 Canadians at least, and more if you include their families, who rely on social assistance because of the fact that they have a severe prolonged disability. That is entirely unacceptable and inappropriate. As part of the reforms, the architectural reforms that Ken discussed in his talk, one of the major proposals that we made at Caledon is moving people with severe disabilities off provincial welfare looking ideally at a federal program that would be adequate, indexed to inflation, that would be portable across the country, that would be equitable in terms of access, and the resulting savings from the provinces and territories would be invested or reinvested in disability supports, and we continue to put forward that proposal. That's something else, Art, if you're looking for a, a priority area, it would be nice to to consider that. But there's other gaps in the income security system. We published a paper in 2008 by Professor Mike Prince from Victoria, University of Victoria, who's here with us today. And it was a very important gap that was identified in terms of the need for medium-term disability program. Because what happens with many people is that they're in or out of the labor market. Current programs function as though you, know, you're, you actually have to be on or off. The world from a policy perspective is very black and white and actually in reality there are many, many shades of grey. The problem is that we're missing that component in the middle and Francis Lincoln asked a question about that, why are so many people now on welfare? It's because the other parts of the system are inadequate and you end up on a last resort system because you have these big gaps that don't actually fill those needs. And so in Michael Prince's paper he made several recommendations for change uh, in terms of a, a medium-term disability income system. Another area on which we've worked in the past is the Registered Disability Savings Plan. And this was an idea that had been put forward by Alec Mansky from the Plan Lifetime Advocacy Network. And he was talking about the need for parents to be able to save money on behalf of their relatives with severe disabilities because they were living in poverty. And we did at Caledon some of the background work related to that to look at how would this be designed and who might qualify and how much could they contribute and how much would it cost and what would be the interaction with existing programs. So we've looked at several aspects of the disability income system. Many people, as I mentioned, have additional costs that they face as a result of disability. And what we have in the country primarily is a tax system that helps people offset some of those costs. So for example, there's a federal medical expense tax credit for itemizable things, for you know areas that you can actually identify. The problem with that is, and we've pointed that out, is that it helps people with higher incomes primarily. And you have to be able to pay for those in the first place. Not much assistance to lower income Canadians with disabilities. There's another tax credit called the disability tax credit. And if you have a disability that is severe and prolonged, you likely can, can um, receive that benefit. But not so fast if you have a mental disability. There are serious eligibility barriers. And in 2003, the federal government appointed a technical advisory committee on tax measures with persons with disabilities. 
and I had been asked to co-chair that committee. We had a, a great group of 12 people making recommendations for change to the tax system. We made 24 recommendations, all of which were implemented over the course of three budgets, but our major proposal was don't use the tax system. It's not the appropriate vehicle or mechanism for helping people with disability supports. Because again, the way in which the measures are designed actually help higher income Canadians primarily. And those who are lower income, modest income Canadians, really derive no benefit. Unless, of course, you're going to design them in a different way. Unless you make them refundable, you're really helping only a certain bracket. So what we said at Caledon is we really need to look at that system of disability supports, that supply of support. Now what do I mean by disability supports? Because it's a very, very big, again, umbrella concept. It includes technical aids and equipment and things that help people, but it also includes services like home care, homemaker assistance that helps you with your house cleaning, attendant care that helps you with your personal grooming, very, very big, as I said, umbrella concept. And these supports and services are delivered by provinces and territories. What does that mean? That it varies widely across the country. So what you might be eligible for in one part of the country is very different from what you might receive elsewhere. But again, despite the wide differences, there are several points or problems that we saw that we identified and wrote about in a report <coughs> called Five Point Plan for Reforming Disability Supports. And our proposals for change had to do with easing access um, and improving the eligibility process so that you wouldn't have to, for example, qualify 14 times over again for all these different programs. Maybe there could be a single entry point or some navigational procedure that would help you. The support should be portable. In other words, you, you shouldn't have to be in a certain venue to receive supports. They should be able to come with you. And that means you may need individualized dollars that follow you through your life. We've talked about disability supports and their importance because what are they for effectively? They're to enable participation in society. That sort of third major area that I talked about. And we've written at Caledon about participation in society. We've talked about accommodation from both a physical accommodation perspective, but also flexibility of rules, procedures, regulations, having supports in place like people to help you, you know, to, to be able to participate in all aspects of society. In fact, we've looked at participation from the broader concept of social inclusion. Recently, we were asked by the city of Hamilton to write a social vision for them about social inclusion. And it was in respect of their role as co-host of the Pan Am Games in 2015. Now the Pan Am Games, I have to say, from their perspective, were actually irrelevant. It was really a way to sort of raise awareness about the fact that the whole city would be talking about this event. And they thought it would be a, a great way to be able to incorporate notions of inclusion and accommodation. And so we've been broad thinking, I hope, in that regard, but maybe not broad enough. Because uh, when I read an article by Andre Picard on January 30th of, of this year, I thought we better pay attention to what he's saying. And I quote briefly, real integration requires a lot more than building ramps, adopting human rights legislation, and funding programs. Grudging accommodation with a dash of tokenism is not enough. If we want people to be healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, and to reach their full potential, they need to be full <coughs> citizens. Very eloquent. Thank you. Herein lies, I think, our first challenge. I honestly don't think in the country we've had a real conversation about deep citizenship when it comes to people with disabilities. Haven't really talked about what that means in terms of real belonging and dignity and respect. The disability community, to your credit, has done a lot of work in this area, and we need to have that conversation. At the turn of the millennium, I wrote a report called Reclaiming Our Humanity, and it was about those values of dignity and respect and how we could embed them in the policy process. Fundamentally, I think uh, you know, it involves changing some of our conceptual underpinnings. Marcia Ryu at York University, you've written for years about well being and social justice as conceptual underpinnings. And, and Andrew, you made reference to the work of Amartya Sen 
the award Nobel Prize winning economist, he talks about a capability framework to underpin our work. And what he means by that is we shouldn't start in the first instance with all the limitations and all the problems that people present. What we should do is say, what are their strengths? What are the natural environments that we need to bolster? And then we can look at all the associated problems. But you don't necessarily start with a program or a service in your thinking, but you do start with networks of support around people and family and friends and what kind of policy environment you need to bolster those kinds of natural supports. And what about your safe and affordable housing where everybody has a decent place to live? And the Housing First Movement has done a lot of work around this. And what about those vibrant communities that are welcoming and that have safe, again, affordable, accessible space. You start with those as policy questions and then move out into some of the other areas of their problems and weaknesses. And I think this um, really is, has started to change. There has been some movement in terms of our actual conceptualization of disability. Thanks to the World Health Organization, Inclusion International, and some other groups, they've been saying, we need to think differently because disability used to be something, we used to understand it as something that you had, that was your problem as an individual. The social model of disability is saying, what we need to do is look at a person within the context of a relevant environment because if that environment has the appropriate accommodation and if that environment has the appropriate adjustment, what you may be able to do is actually minimize, if not eliminate entirely, the impact of that disability. And it shifts your focus away from the people with their so-called limitations to the environments that are not good enough to accommodate and to enable participation in society. I honestly think we have to have a similar conversation with respect to the aging society. Because if you read only the headlines in the newspapers, you would think that all those, that heavy boatload of, of, of baby boomers, they're going to sink our demographic ship. And we are all going down with that age dependency ratio. And if you listen to the World Economic Forum, for example, they've talked about the fact that population aging is going to have an impact on the G20 that will be 10 times greater than the most recent recession, and in fact, greatest in Canada. There's also, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the economic theory called the lump of labor, um, where the baby boomers are seen to be a lump. Arthur, you, <laughs> you're smiling. You, Oh, okay, the post baby boomer, yeah, um, the, where where the baby boomers comprise this big lump, and 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 baby boomers are keeping the next generation out of the job opportunities. And in fact, that theory has recently been dispelled by a Boston College study. But all of this to say, I think we need to have a far more positive conversation about aging as well. And thankfully, some of this is going on. The International Federation of Aging is, you know, putting forward some notions. The uh, McMaster University just received a $10 million grant to study optimal aging. It was work at the University of Alberta. Uh, we have a tremendous resource, an invaluable resource of very uh, intelligent people and, and a great human capital. And we shouldn't be writing it off in terms of our burden on society. And as if that weren't enough to do, <laughs> I think there's some real ethical challenges that we face as well. And they derive from many of the scientific advances, actually, that we've seen in recent years and technological developments that have been very good on the whole, that have prolonged life and that enable independent living. And yet they're posing some important challenges that we need to address. For example, we know that we now can identify in utero many potentially disabling conditions, many more than we ever were able to in the past. What are we going to do with that information? Heidi, are we going to practice eugenics? And what about the people who slip the net? And at the other end of the life spectrum, we're making decisions already about end of life and who's going to get access to expensive kinds of technologies. I don't think there's anywhere in the country where we're having informed, dispassionate, and passionate, I guess, conversation about these very, very significant issues. And just an occasional op-ed on the commentary pages of the Globe and Mail, <laughs> um, it's, it's not enough for the, the I, I think, the profound questions that we face. And there are some other ethical issues, and they relate to technological developments. There are many of these 
technologies that allow people to live independently and allow seniors to live at home longer. And that's great because most Canadians are saying that they would love to live at home. And in Manitoba, thank you, Grant Doak, you have a aging at home a strategy. Ontario has an aging in place strategy. There's recognition of that desire to live at home. But at the same time, I think we have to ask some about some of the social implications of that independent living, you know, those advances. Will we be letting people live on their own longer without personal visits? You know, you could just see in future a dashboard, like a, a, an air traffic controller, and here's all the blood pressure readings, you know, here's the heart <laughs> monitor, here's the, you know, monitoring the mental function, and anytime a red light goes off, okay, we'll dispatch somebody to the home to check on you. We need to make sure that we don't have technology replacing the human contact that remains so important. So I think this whole range of areas related to our values, conceptual underpinnings, ethical issues, comprise a first major challenge. The second one, I just have, so we'll do a, a, just a second ring of challenge that we face in future with respect to disability and the aging society has to do with the informal sources of support. And that can be broadly defined, but at Caledon we work primarily on informal caregivers. And these are the people who provide about 85% of the care of those who require long-term assistance. And informal caregivers have a contribution to the Canadian economy worth about $5 billion. And in fact, some studies say about $25 billion. So they are an essential workforce. And as an essential workforce, they have concerns with respect to money, working conditions, and training. In terms of money, you know, several years ago we had an op-ed published on Halloween and it was called The Three Ghosts of Poverty. And the ghosts are the factors that haunt caregivers throughout the course of their caregiving career. Because if they're caring for somebody who happens to be living in poverty, they likely are paying for many of the basics. And the poverty of the care receiver effectively becomes the poverty of the caregiver. That's why it's so important to shore up those disability and other income programs that we've been talking about. The second problem has to do with the fact that if you're caring for somebody who requires equipment and, and you have to pay hundreds or even thousands of dollars a year, as a caregiver, you probably are paying many of those costs. And you may be able to get some deductions, you may be able to claim some of the caregiver credits that we have in the country. We do have them. But again, the problem is that you have to have a high enough income in order to be able to claim those credits. There is some good uh, work underway in the country, and again, I look to Manitoba for the fact that they provide a refundable tax credit for caregivers, as does Quebec. And Nova Scotia has an allowance that it pays to caregivers in respect of those extra costs. So there are some important areas where we actually can make some change to help people in a constructive and fundamental if you're a caregiver, you may actually be jeopardizing your future income because you can't continue to contribute to your pension. And other countries of the world, like the UK, Australia, Norway, make some provision for continuing to make a contribution to pension plans. And at Caledon, we put forward some proposals for looking at our Canada pension plan. Maybe there are some caregiving provisions upon which we can build so that we can ensure that caregivers don't live in poverty in the future. You may need flexibility with your employment, certainly if you're caring for somebody with an episodic condition that I described, or even an elderly relative. You may need flexibility. Now, obviously, that's a discussion between an employer and an employee. But again, other countries of the world have recognized the need for caregivers to have some flexibility at work. And countries like New Zealand, for example, have a piece of legislation where they say, you as an employee, after six months of work, can ask for flexible work if you're involved in caregiving. Doesn't mean you're going to get it, but at least you won't be fired if you ask. What we have in Canada are compassionate care leave provisions of our employment insurance program. What that means is you can claim up to six weeks of work if your relative, the relative or person for whom you're caring, will die within six months. You have to guarantee that or at least sign to that effect, and so does your doctor you can well imagine why this has a very low take-up rate in the country, <laughs> a few thousand people, but we can certainly do better than that. 
In terms of training, caregivers are being asked to do some very difficult things at home to, uh, you know, without the uh, appropriate kind of support or even um, assistance in terms of how you deal with some of these difficult situations related to, for example, degenerative conditions or dementia or even mental illness where there may be some challenging situations that arise and people basically are on their own with very little respite. And so this is a whole area of work about which we've written that we want to pursue in future. I'd say that's the sort of second major ring of, of challenge for the future. And finally, what's the third ring? It has to do with formal supports in communities. The disability supports to which I referred earlier, like the aids and equipment, all the services like home care and homemaker assistance, but I would even include in their long-term care. Our system right now is terribly overburdened. We can't meet the needs that exist right now, let alone think about what will happen in future. And I know we have a healthier population than in the past, but we have far more people who are living with chronic conditions than ever before, who will need some form of assistance, even if it's temporary. Uh, and we're simply not geared up to that. The, Andre, you wrote, I think, about the fact that there's 7,500 Canadians living in hospital at a cost of about $4 billion a year because there's nowhere for them to go and there are no supports in the community to help them get out of the hospital. That's a really serious problem. I know that there are many of you in this room and, and um, many others who would say, all we need to do is take money from the expensive hospital sector and put it over to the community sector. Yes, of course we need to do that. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> but it won't be enough and it won't come fast enough to meet the current and the future demand. And the other problem that we face in the formal care sector is that people are working without a living wage. The working conditions are not terribly good. And if you want to attract and retain good people, you need to have appropriate conditions in that sector so that you're not, you know, looking at making your innovation um, a, a, a sort of a down, a downward pressure uh, on wages in the community. Looking at saving funds simply through saving money on what you pay in salaries. So I'm working on a paper right now at Caledon that's looking at a number of ways in which we can bolster the, the money that's going into this sector. And it includes things like a social insurance. We use social insurances only right now in Canada for income security programs, I can describe. But other countries of the world, like Germany, Japan, Korea, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, have some form of social insurance. The University of Toronto professor um, has suggested this for Mark Stabile, has suggested that we use this for prescription drugs, for example. Or maybe we would look at some form of tax-assisted savings program that would enable people to save because we need to put aside some money for that purpose. Because Stats Can has said that more than 50% of us will actually need that form of care by the time we're 75. So this is a population issue. Or maybe there's some new kinds of arrangements that we haven't even thought about that may, we may want to consider. Like, for example, um, low interest loans. And, and some of the work in Australia is um, maybe interesting to look at in this regard. All these areas require study. They may, at the end of the day, be administratively impossible, or they may mean that you'll take money from another you know, part of re your revenue and you don't want to do it. But we need to have the conversation. And at the very least, we need to you know, put this on the table and look at some of the other options, because we can't continue to say, sorry, the system is full, and we can't do anything about it. And the other problem that we face in that respect is we create intergenerational tensions. Because we say, well, if we want to bolster long-term care, we have to take it from youth. We have to take it from childcare. We have to take it from the education section, sector. And it creates this kind of intergener intergenerational tension. I think that's a completely false argument. We simply haven't been creative enough about the kinds of resources that we're bringing to the table. So this is a very big agenda, as you can see. As I said, on the outer ring, if you look at this as sort of concentric circles, on the outer ring, the formal supports, how we're going to make those available and how we're going to finance them. And then inside, the informal supports, caregivers and other informal supports, and what we're going to do about that in the future. And then right at the very heart are some of the natural environments and the questions that we face related to our ethics, 
our conceptual underpinnings, and our values. Because I honestly believe that that ideal of reclaiming our humanity is as powerful and as relevant as ever. Thank you. Sherry, so I'm going to stand here so I can read my notes. I'm a print reporter, so. <laughs> I have to start off by saying happy birthday to Caledon, a very young 20. That's from someone who just celebrated his 25th anniversary at the Globe. Uh, I, I, I've noticed today, too, that a Ken battle story is de rigueur to start, so I have mine. Uh, Ken won't remember this, but he, uh, uh, in 1986, I was working on my thesis at university on guaranteed annual income and went to see Ken, spent a lot of time with him, and he was very helpful. And by helpful in this case, I mean that he destroyed my entire thesis, <laughs> and I pretty well had to start over. So I thank him to this day. Uh, and the last little thing, I was following the discussion on Twitter earlier, and I noticed people are tweeting, so I'll give you my Twitter handle for what it's worth. It's Picard on health, all one word. And now I'll get into the, the meat of the issue. Now, I'm in the unenviable position of following Sherry Torsman. Uh, that's difficult, one, because she's very eloquent and, you know, did that whole thing like as she had memorized her speech. It was amazing. And the second part is I agree with almost everything she said, so it doesn't make for a very exciting rebuttal. Uh, you know, if you'd had somebody like Jerry Ritz up here talking about food safety, I'd be a lot more <laughs> fired up and uh, easy to, to go at, uh, get, get me cranked up. But so what I'll do uh, in the time that I have is I'll be brief so we can have more discussion and I'll reiterate and expand on some of the things that Sherry said with, of course, my, my bias, emphasizing what I think is important. Uh, so let me start with the numbers, because I think numbers are always important to policy discussions. At the Globe and Mail, we love numbers, especially if they have dollar signs in front of them. So we like, like, like numbers. So we heard 4.4 million Canadians are living with a disability, so almost 15% of the population. Uh, I think uh, even more important than that is that we need to recognize that virtually all of us are going to live with a disability at some point in our life. That's the new reality of living. Uh, this is not a, a marginal issue anymore, it's a mainstream issue. And I think that's how you, you make this as a political argument. So let me give you some data. So life expectancy in Canada now is roughly 82, slightly more for women than men, but say 82. But disability-free life expectancy is just over 70. So what does that mean? It means practically that we can expect to live about 12 years on average with a disability. Each and every one of us. You know, that's an average, so it, it's different. but. Uh, it, again, we're all going to feel this in some way. Um, but as you heard from Sherry, and she made this point very eloquently, we don't have a system to deal with this, with this reality of everybody being disabled. We have just piecemeal programs. And these piecemeal programs, we call it our social safety net, although it has lots of holes in it, uh, it was fashioned in essentially the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, I write mostly about Medicare, which was, became a national program in 57. But all the social programs came to birth around that time, around the war time, et cetera, and the baby boom. Now, back then, we were a young, healthy country. We created a safety net for the needs that we had. Um, so in 1957, when Medicare was born, essentially federally, the average age in Canada was 27. So today, our average age is 47. We're a very, very different, a very different world. Uh, chronic conditions are now the norm. Um, most people over the age of 50 have a chronic condition. By the time you get to 70, it's about three on average. At 80, it's about five. So again, this is normal. And I'll talk about what that means later. Doesn't mean everybody's disabled. So I, I think what we have to do first and foremost is uh, say, listen, we need to shape a social safety net to today's society. Uh, with Medicare, we essentially are trying to deliver Medicare with, uh, you know, 21st century needs with a 1950 system. I think we're doing that with most of our social programs. Uh, we have to stop expecting everyone to adapt to the system and create a system in the likeness of the people. And what does that mean? You, you heard again in her talk what that means. That things like pharmacare, long-term insurance, uh, care insurance, etc. Not just mother's allowance, not just educational uh, grants, etc. That were designed for a society with lots of kids. Um, now, I think, uh, let me talk a bit about the disability. Uh, I think a really important point that was made is that the disability community is very diverse. Uh, it's a community of communities. There's all kinds of various groups within that, that 
catch-all phrase disability. Um, I think the future of social programs is increasingly to target uh, specific populations uh, rather than our traditional shotgun approach. That's good. There's some good things to be said about the shotgun approach. It appeals to the middle class voter, etc. But I think the future is really about, about targeting, being more specific uh, and more focused. Um, and I can come back to that later if you want. Uh, Sherry spoke about three principal needs uh, for those with disabilities. And I totally agree with these. Adequate income, uh, help with additional costs, and full citizenship. And I'm, I'm really glad that she emphasized that last one. This has been a, a recurring topic for me for many years, and she very gracefully quoted from something I'd written on the topic recently. Um, I think the purpose of social programs is traditionally to redistribute wealth. That's, that's what we've done uh, for many years. But I think programs, to be truly effective, have to do more than that. They have to redistribute power as well. We don't always talk about that element. We know money equals power, but we have to be more, uh, I think, state that much more clearly, that it's about power as well. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that we have to ensure that people with disabilities have adequate income, uh, just like everyone else in society, hopefully. But money isn't enough. Uh, I don't think inequality is solely an economic issue. It, it goes beyond that. Uh, we have to ensure that people have the opportunity to fulfill their aspirations. That's what true equality is. Uh, if they can and they want to work, it should be meaningful work. Uh, not just token programs like having people in the, in the wood shop, as we had for many years. That's what work was for the disabled. And it wasn't work. It was just make work. And it was insulting and demeaning. Uh, I think this same philosophy applies to Sherry's second point, which was, you know, let's give people assistance with additional costs. Uh, the, these costs are mostly for programs, uh, translators, health aides, uh, equipment, programs. And again, all these programs are to do one thing. They're to level the playing field, to make things a little fairer for people who have a, a special need. Uh, they're not gifts, and we have to stop pretending that, treating them like that. They're necessities uh, to make people full members of society. And I think uh, real integration uh, it does require much more than building ramps and things. That's nice. Those are technical issues. Uh, having human rights legislation is great. But we need to have this overarching philosophy of equality, uh, not just on paper, uh, not just grudging accommodation, but a real uh, you know, a gut feeling that this is the thing we're going to do, and it overrides or it's integrated into every program we adopt, uh, well beyond just the, the lovely written legislation. I want to emphasize too that equity is not the same as equality. We have to make that distinction. It's an important one in healthcare and elsewhere. Um, if we want to have an equitable society, uh, we don't necessarily provide assistance to everyone in the same manner. I think, in fact, we have to necessarily provide help in an unequal fashion because people's needs are, are not the same. Well, let me talk about the third point, which I think is the most important one, citizenship. What do, what do we mean by full citizenship? Uh, I think that it means that everyone has the same opportunity to reach their full potential. Uh, it doesn't mean that everyone has to be the same. It doesn't mean everyone has the same potential. And it doesn't mean everybody has the same aspirations. They just have this, the ability to, to hope and to dream, if you want. At the risk of sounding too much like Deepak Chopra or something, I, I think there is some, uh, some philosophical stuff here that we have to consider. You know, we have to step back and say, well, fundamentally, what, what do we want in life? Uh, what does everyone want, regardless of ability or disability? Uh, they want to belong, and they want to be loved, and they want to live their lives to the fullest. And that's, a, that's the fundamental goal that all our programs should, should aim for. Uh, people who are lonely, who are marginalized, uh, when they exist, I think we failed as a society. And I, uh, several times, have used a quote that I, I got from my friend Al Mansky at Plan. Uh, he often quotes Mother Teresa, saying, loneliness is the greatest poverty. And, and I think that's very true. And uh, in Canada, uh, who are the lonely? The lonely are people with disabilities and their seniors, these two groups that we're talking about today. And there's too much poverty and too much loneliness in those communities. And that, to me, speaks to a, a pretty large social policy failure. 
Well, how do we correct that? Well, I think we correct it. To correct it, we have to be uh, not just little tiny programs here and there, little corrections. I think we have to be much more intentional and much more bold about what we want to do and much more driven. Uh, we have to have this vision of a fairer, more inclusive society, not just on paper, but in practice. Uh, the goal, I think, has to be community building. We talk a lot about this abstract notion of community, but community is a really important thing. Uh, people are not healthy unless they're in a healthy community. And to have that, we need some form of community support. Um, so let me take the, the last little time I have to talk about the, the second aspect, about the, the aging element. Um, and again, I think uh, Cherry made a very good point that you can't confound aging and disability, even though there, there is overlap. They are different issues and different communities. Now, I'll say up front, and people who read my column will know this because I harp on about this often, but I, I don't believe in this whole grey tsunami business. I think it's nonsense. Uh, we're not going to be bankrupted by baby boomers getting old and wanting health care. I think that's just a hysterical position that's not supported by, by data, and it's an excuse to, to cut programs, etc. So there's my, my bias. Uh, but it's not to say that boomers don't pose particular policy challenges. They do. Um, but I don't think they pose any greater a challenge than the actual boom itself did back in the post-war years. Uh, we changed society fairly fundamentally and programs fundamentally to respond to that and we should be doing so 50, 60 years later. Uh, I don't know why it's a bigger challenge today than it was then. Uh, you know, do the elderly have more challenges than the young? Not, not particularly when you get right down to it, when you take away your, your biases. Uh, Canada's older than it's ever been, there's no question, but it's also healthier than it's ever been. There's two sides to all these stories. Uh, we live longer, but we live better. Uh, people work longer, they contribute more to society as the age, etc. Um, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of very healthy, active 70, 80, and 90 year olds. In fact, uh, the data tell us that they're the majority. That's not a great tsunami, that's a good news story. Uh, older does not equal sicker, and we have to stop making that in that formula. Uh, Yes, people are living with chronic conditions, and I talked about that. People, about every, half of people over 50 have one condition. By the time you get to 80, it's about five. But almost all these conditions are manageable. They're not disabling. A very small percentage of them are actually disabling. So we, again, we confound those issues. Um, and again, the reality is we use the majority of our lifetime health costs in the last few months of our lives, but that's regardless of when we die, whether it's at five, 50, or 85. So the aging doesn't necessarily impact costs that much. A little bit, but not that much. So let me give you a little bit of data. I know I've been largely data-free to date, but I, that's a journalist for you. So I'll give you a little uh, study that I was interested in from the Urban Futures Institute. Uh, they looked at what's actually driving health costs. Uh, they found 24% of, this over the last decade, 24% of increased health costs were due to aging. One quarter. Uh, increased utilization, 60%, the vast majority, uh, across the board. We're just using more healthcare. Not necessarily well, there's a lot of overtreatment. Then there's inflation, 19%, and population growth, 7%. But again, we, we're giving too much uh, blame to, to aging. Um, okay, two minutes. Um, skip over a bit. Uh, now, having said all that, I don't want to be too negative. Uh, I think we have some good programs. Uh, we have good programs for the disabled, we have good programs for the, the frail elderly, people who need help. Uh, but we don't learn enough from each other. So I travel around the country a lot, I see all these wonderful pilot projects. Canada's the land of pilot projects. And we do a terrible job of sharing and implementing and scaling up. I think that's our biggest policy challenge in Canada, is to do what we already know, rather than research it over and over again. Uh, I think the other problem with our programs is that they're too sporadic and they're too inflexible. And again, Sherry talked about this. Uh, and I think flexibility is a real big policy challenge in both these areas, disability and chronic illness or aging. Because uh, illnesses and disability are, are rarely linear anymore. That's how it used to be. You get sick, sicker, sicker, you die. That's the old model. That's not how life is anymore, for better or worse. Uh, 
it's not a the, the needs aren't binary there's ebbs and flows so you can have a, a, a bout of mental illness get better go you should be able to go back to work but our programs don't allow for that you have to be sick or well uh, dying or not dying and we had a like a, a very kafkaesque example of that in toronto last week where there was a story of a, a 93 year old woman who lost her home care uh, she had been granted uh, palliative home care for six weeks and the nerve of her she didn't die in six weeks so they cut her off that's not flexibility that's not good social policy that's stupidity and there's too much of that in our system uh, we should be celebrating the fact that she she got better she's 93 and she's better she didn't die you don't get punished for that or at least you shouldn't I, I think we can do better than that so in closing let me say one one last thing uh, and it's not always popular to say this in social policy circles it makes me sound right-wing but too bad uh, we live in this rights-based society uh, we have a lot of entitlement uh, and that's good I think it's a good thing we have social programs uh, chief among them Medicare but the flip side to rights is responsibilities we don't talk about our responsibilities any enough I don't think uh, if we're going to embrace this philosophy of keeping seniors in the community uh, of granting full citizenship to those with disabilities I think we have to make real efforts as individuals to do our part, not just by paying taxes, but by, by living up to these standards and this philosophy. So let me end with some practical examples. What does it mean? Uh, it means befriending your neighbor who uses a wheelchair, not just waving to them across the street. Hey, buddy. Hey, I'm so good to the disabled. Hey, how are you doing? Get in your car. You have to, have to talk to them, engage them, make them part of your community. Uh, it means not just feeling sorry for the lonely widow down the street, but you know, inviting her for dinner, uh, shoveling her walk, uh, give some some life to your principles. Uh, and finally, you know, uh, reach out to the person whose son at work is suffering from schizophrenia. And don't just have pity for them from afar. Uh, I think social policy just can't be abstract. It has to be hands-on, and we have to live it, not just talk about it. So I'll stop talking there and uh, welcome the discussion. Thanks.